We're now going to look at quite a few properties of permutations, which means we're going to look at some theorems. I do want to point out that the proofs of those theorems are in your textbook, so I'm not going to regurgitate for you, those for you here. Instead, I'm going to look at making sure that you understand what each theorem says and looking at a couple of examples. Our first property says that every permutation of a finite set can be written as a cycle or as a product of disjoint cycles. So essentially what we're saying is that we can compose any permutation to arrive at a solution where each value is written only once. So as you can see, I've got three permutations here, which I'm composing. And you can also see very clearly that one occurs more than once, two occurs more than once, etc. So essentially this property is just saying that we can compose the functions. So one goes to two, two to three, three to two, two to four, four stays the same, four stays the same, four to six, six stays, six back to one, and then back to three. So three stays, three to two, two to five, five to one, one stays, one to three, close it. And then we have one, two, three, four, five. So we have six, so six to five, five stays, five to six, close it. So that's all this first property is saying is any time that you have a product of cycles that you can write it as a product of disjoint cycles. Now disjoint being that they don't share any elements in common. This property tells us that disjoint cycles commute or if we have two um, cycles that don't have any entries in common, no elements in common, then alpha beta is equal to beta alpha. So for our first example, we can see that alpha and beta, in fact, are not disjoint. They have entries in common. So the answer is likely no. Um, so let's take a look at alpha beta, which means beta x on the element first, then alpha. So if I start with one, one goes to two, and then two goes to five. So again, I'm starting here and then moving there. Five goes to one, one goes to three. Three stays the same, three goes to two. Two goes to four, four stays the same. Four goes to six, six goes to one. So that's alpha beta. Now let's do beta alpha, which means first alpha is going to act on it and then beta. So starting at one, one goes to three, three stays the same. Three goes to two, two goes to four. Four stays the same, four goes to six. Six goes to one, one goes to two. Two goes to five, five goes to one, and then we have six. So we can see that these two are not equal. So no, that is not the case. Now this one's kind of fun. What's alpha beta? Well. One goes to two, two stays the same. Or sorry, one doesn't go anywhere, one goes to two. And then two doesn't go anywhere, two goes to four. And then four doesn't go anywhere, four goes to one. And then three goes to five, five doesn't go anywhere. And then five goes to three, and three doesn't go anywhere. So guess what beta alpha is gonna be? Well, yep, you guessed it. If I start at one and we let alpha act on the element first, one goes to two and then two doesn't do anything. And then two goes to four and four doesn't do anything. And then three goes to five, or three doesn't do anything, three goes to five, five doesn't do anything, five goes to three. So the exact same thing, um, again, because they don't have any elements in common, so they're not going to act upon one another. This property talks about the order of a permutation as being the least common multiple of the cycle length. Now, in this case, it's the least common multiple of any disjoint cycles. So for instance, in our first example, we're asked to find the order of alpha beta. Now, keep in mind when I'm talking about the order of alpha beta, I'm saying how many times do I have to multiply to get back to the identity which is one, two, three, four, five, six for our first example, because there are six elements. So I have to first find alpha beta. 
So I'm not asking for how many elements are in alpha, beta. I'm saying what is the order? How many times do I have to multiply it to get back to the identity? So the first thing I have to do is make sure alpha, beta is disjoint. So I start with one. And remember, I'm starting with beta. So one would go to two, two to five. And then five goes to one, one to three, three stays the same, three to two, two goes to four, four stays the same, four goes to six, six goes to one, so I close it. So here is alpha beta. So again, how many times now would I have to multiply alpha beta? So essentially we're saying this to what power gives me the identity. And we can find that using the least common multiple of the cycle length. So the least common multiple of, this is a cycle length of five, and this is a cycle length of one, so obviously that's five. So I would have to multiply one, five, three, two, four, and I wouldn't even worry about the six, five times to get back to the identity. Now it's much easier for our second example because those are already disjoint. So again, what happens here, just so you understand what's happening, if I take one, two, four and square it, I get one, four, two. And if I take one, four, two times one, two, four, in other words, if I take one, two, four and cube it, I get back to the identity. So basically every multiple of three, I'll be back to the identity. If I take this and square it, I get to the identity. So every multiple of two, I will get back to the identity. So that's why this rule works. The least common multiple of the cycle length would say, okay, this is going to be at the identity every multiple of two. This is gonna be at the identity every multiple of three. What's the first time those two are gonna coincide? Well, the least common multiple of three and two is six. So that's why that works. Let's take a look at two other applications of this that might come in handy. So what are the possible orders of the elements of S4? So the elements of S4, if you'll recall, we're looking at any permutations of one, two, three, four. So how do I determine the possible orders? Well, let's think about what that could look like. I could have a four cycle. I could have a three cycle and a one cycle. Oops. I could have a two cycle and a two cycle. I keep wanting to write the number two. I could have a two cycle and two one cycles. And I could have the identity. So the possible orders, well, this is a four cycle. So the least common multiple of four is four. Um, this is a three cycle and a one cycle. So that's three. Two and two, the least common multiple is two. Two, one, one, again, least common multiple is two. And one, 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 that's uh, basically four one cycles. So the possible orders are one, two, three, and four. Now, how many elements of order two are there? So looking at elements of order two, we would have to do a little bit of math here. So let's think about the two different ways that this could happen. So obviously we're going to use the rule of sum for, you know, to add each outcome and then rule of product to find each outcome. So let's start with a two cycle and a two cycle. Well, a two cycle and a two cycle says I could have four options for my first item and three for my second. But remember that one, two and two, one are the same two cycles, so I have to divide it by two. And then same thing here, now I've got two options left and one option left and I have to divide it by two. And also, what's going to happen is if I had one, four, 
2, 3, that's the same as 2, 3, 1, 4. So I have to divide the entire product by 2. So if I find that, it's really 1 half of 12 divided by 2, which is 6, and then 2 times 1 divided by 2, which is 1. So that's three options. Now let's do the same thing for the two cycle with two one cycles. So we don't care about these. So really, I just have to look at the two cycle. So the two cycle would be there's four options. Oops. Two cycle, one cycle, one cycle. So we're not concerned about the other two values, but we know that there's four options here and three here. Again, we would divide by two the first time because again, one four is the same as four one. I don't have to divide by two again because there's only one two cycle. So this is four times three or 12 divided by two, which is six. So three plus six means a total of nine. So I'm going to erase some of this work here because I've written all over this screen and I want to show you that we're right because that always feels good to be so right. All right. So here's S4 in all its glory. Notice we have one element of order one. We have one, two, three elements that are two by two. So two cycle and a two cycle. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six that are two, one, one. And notice the one, one isn't written. So we have done a great job of finding the answers to those questions correctly. This next property has everything to do with whether or not we call a permutation even or odd, um, because the set of even uh, permutations is actually going to be something important to us. So how do we determine if a transposition, I'm sorry, a permutation is even or odd? We look at the number of transpositions. How do we know the number of transpositions? We use this theorem that says every permutation is a product of two cycles. So let's see how we can rewrite it. This is our permutation. I want to rewrite it as a product of two cycles. That can be written as 1, 2, 1, 6, 1, 5, and 1, 3. Now, does this work? And when I say that, I mean, if I multiply these back out, do I end up back here again? Well, let's try. If I start at 1, 1 would go to 3, and 3 doesn't do anything else. And then 3 would go to 1, and then 1 would go to 5, and then 5 doesn't do anything else. And then 5 wouldn't do anything, 5 goes to 1, 1 goes to 6, 6 doesn't do anything else. And then 6 doesn't do anything for the first two, and then 6 goes to 1, and 1 goes to 2. And then of course, 2 is going to go back to 1. So we can see that that is going to work, and it's going to work that way each and every time. So easy enough, how do I then rewrite this disjoint product as two cycles? I would write 1, 3, 1, 2, 1, 4, 5, 6, 5, 7. So what happens here? There are four elements, so this is an even permutation. What happens here? There are five, so this is an odd permutation. The last thing that we want to talk about is the subgroup A sub n. So if we look at S sub n, which is, of course, all of the permutations of n items, we have a subgroup of S sub n called the alternating group, and it's the set of all even permutations. So again, when we're talking about even permutations, we're talking about the number of two cycles has to be an even number. And what we should understand about that is that in order to find how many elements are in a sub n, we're going to take n factorial divided by 2. So keep in mind, when we were finding the number of elements in s sub n, we said that was n factorial. So in a sub n, it's n factorial divided by 2, which of course implies half of the elements in a sub n are of s sub n are in a sub n. So I want us to look at a4. 
and S4. And we can see that the identity, so that one identity element, is in fact in A4. And that makes sense because we're saying A4 is a subgroup and a subgroup must contain the identity. And then note these elements are in A4 because the this is two, two cycles, two, two cycles, which makes it an even. Now notice these are not because that's just one two cycle, so that's odd. Now these are three cycles, but what we know or what we just learned is for instance, two, three, four can be written as two, four, two, three, and that's what makes it even. So all eight of those are three cycles, which of course are going to be even because they can be written as the product of two, two cycles. Up next, definition and understanding of isomorphisms.